Hello. Hi. I'm Tanya. I'm Nikki. We are a thousand eyes in one. You know us as a podcast (laughs) (laughs) about Game of Thrones and a song of ice and fire. And this is our wine on an empty stomach book club. (laughs) I had to turn down my YouTube on my other window because I was like, oh, that's really loud. Yeah, same thing happened to me. (laughs) Uh, I can't tell who that is watching, but hello. Hello. Welcome. We're excited. Uh, Welcome to our cursed book club. This is, (laughs) I think, maybe the fifth or the sixth time we've tried to do this. And, um, you know, by the good graces of the universe, no one died this time. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Uh, We're talking about Who Fears Death by Nnedi Okorafor. Um, we decided to do this book club just to talk about books we like. We're not going to critique, you know. We're not, we're not literary. We're not critics, ex- experts. Uh, we just what we love reading, and we want to just talk about books that we really enjoy. This was one of them. The reason we chose this book um, is because we also have a Game of Thrones podcast and trivia. Join it, like, subscribe, all that stuff. And uh, George R. R. Martin, who wrote Game of Thrones, is heading up the HBO adaptation of this book. So it seemed yep. like it was a natural a natural segue for us. Yep, yep. And this is the first time I think that we've really gone live, so it's really <laughs> weird. And we're it slightly really uncomfortable. Weird. Hey Carrie. Thanks for joining. Um I, I you know what, let's just do this part really quickly. Um we will probably talk about spoilers, but before we even get into that, this is not for children. This is adult no. content. There is sexual violence. There is genital mutilation. There's rape. There's death in many ways. Um, uh, rampant, toxic patriarchy and um, oppression. So, yeah. So, content warning: This is not for your kids. This is our disclaimer. Hide them. You've been warned. <laughs> um. Do you want to do a quick plot summary or do you want me to? Uh, do a plot summary. Oh, well, you know, before I do plot summary, let's give our shout outs to Nnedi Okorafor. Uh, she is a multi-award winning author, um, Hugo, Hugo Nebula, all the prestigious sci-fi fantasy awards, uh, Nigerian American, and she calls this genre African futurism, which is a term that she coined. And uh, basically... What it's concerned with is visions of the future, uh, interest in technology, sometimes they leave the earth, and it's used on the optimistic perspective, but it's centered and predominantly written by people of African scent. So Af- African Africans, not African Americans, and most of these stories are rooted in Africa, So, which is a continent, not a country, for those who don't know. <laughs> And you can check out some of her other books, like her Akata series. Um, she's been writing Shuri for Marvel, and uh, one uh, one of the other comics she's doing is Black Panther. And she's also co-writing Octavia Butler's Wild Seed adaptation for Amazon Prime. Which I'm super looking forward to, because I really, really loved Wild Seed. So, a quick plot summary. Um, this takes place in an alternate future Sudan. Our main character, Onya Sonu, is a woman who's called Ewu, which means she's a child of a rape, um, of the rape of a woman from the Okeke tribe by a man of the Nuru tribe. Um, because of this, the village shuns her, people shun her in general, and she's haunted by her biological father, who was a Nuru uh, sorcerer. Mm -hmm. she finds out that she has magic and begins training with a sorcerer in her town along the way she makes some new friends and meets another boy who's also Ewu but was not the product of a rape but was persecuted anyway Uh, the story has a lot of other than a lot of rape uh, the the new rule are like Cersei yeah. Child, we're in for a bit of rape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so she essentially goes on a quest to hunt down her biological father. 
Yes, to hunt down and kill him for basically yeah. all raping her mother and basically spearheading what is, you know... The OKK the, genocide. The, the, yeah, OKK genocide through rape, essentially. Basically, they want to destroy their culture, and the way they do that is by systematically raping and destroying their culture because... As we find out in the book, once a woman has been had like one of the once the OKK women has been suffered by this, she's basically dead to her family and her the rest of her village, and is often mm-hmm. left, to, left to fend for herself, um, which obviously leads to the destruction of their culture. Right. So with all that I'm gonna, darkness, <laughs> with all that darkness, yes, Carrie, um, it is heavy stuff. This is yeah. this is a type of book that you if this is not joy reading. You're like, right? You don't pick it up. And you're like, oh, I think I'm going to read this book. It's going to be great. No, you think that you're going to do that. And then it's like, oh, wait, actually, I need to put this down and walk away because that was intense. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's a really, really well written, really good story. And I've read it multiple times. And. Part of why I liked it, um, aside from just, you know, magic and black people, Mm -hmm. um, I really liked the characters, especially Onyesonu. What do you like best about her? I liked that she wasn't this perfect heroine. You know, she... She has a short temper. She's really angry, and rightfully so. But she's also she can also be completely out of control sometimes. And like I found myself at times being like, oh my god, Onye, shut up and let them talk. <laughs> <laughs> you know? stand to listen this time. Right. But, uh, but at the same time, I liked it. I liked that she was so headstrong and like um, passionate. You know what? You know, she... I'm going to throw this out there. I read a review um, a couple of days ago that someone said that she was a typical hero. And I was like, typical hero where? Like, she's like, the, her most, the most powerful thing is that, um, you know, she's constantly having to transform her rage, you know, from her, from her genesis into something more powerful. Um, and she's, yeah, you're right. She's not a perfect, she's not a perfect hero. Um, she's I don't very, see she's, her as a typical hero at all. Either. She's like she's petty and she's spiteful, and yeah. you know, and she's she's constantly you know, and I like her indignation at the injustice that's um, all around her in society and how she questions everything. Mm-hmm. No, I totally didn't see her as a typical hero because she wasn't. She was being heroic in the sense that she's trying to save the OKK people. Mm-hmm. But on her path, she wasn't trying to, like, save everybody. You know what I right. mean? Like, mm-hmm. Ask the town. She, she was punishing behind. people. Yeah, like she <laughs> left a town blind out of rage. She forced townspeople to relive her mother's rape through her mother's eyes. Mm-hmm. And didn't even stop to think about the fact that there were children there. Right. And then flattened the town towards the end. Basically yeah. destroyed it. She, she, made, she forced herself to conceive in order to destroy, <laughs> to destroy, in order to yeah. destroy a town. Which she is, killed all the men and made all the women pregnant. Yeah. Like, that's not heroic. No. But I get it. She was pissed. She, you know, she was really, really angry. Um, <sighs> we choose violence. Was... <laughs> <laughs> she woke up every day and chose violence. She really did. What were you going to say? This book was. There were parts of it that, like, I felt like I had to just put it down. Oh, yeah. I definitely walked away for a couple weeks at a time when I was, like, all the times that I've read this, I've been like, oh, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go read something else because I need to read something else. Yeah, I mean, the her when she the rec- the recollection of her mother's rape, I think was probably the hardest to read. 
mm-hmm. because it goes on. It feels like it goes on for so long. Yeah, it's 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 not a brief accounting. It's very very detailed, and you through her mother's eyes, you see what's happening around her. It's not just what's happening to her. It's that people are being the women around her are being raped and tortured as well. While the newer women are are singing and they're singing right the the people the mm-hmm. men who are raped the new the new men who are raping and the new women who are you know teasing them and taunting them and even holding their legs open in some cases are singing this is a joyful madness that's that's happening which we find out later um is because of daib onye's biological daib, body. yeah a biological father because that's how powerful it is he's basically putting these people in a, a casting this a spell um a juju on these people and force well gives them the little push they need to go a little extra hard right it to like make them more vicious and more wild it's like it's like the thrill in stormlight archive yes but no dalinar <laughs> that's what it reminded me of was, i was like that, that parallel yeah um i mean they you know they were still without the help of Dave, they were still committing genocide but mm-hmm. with um daib's leadership it just like enhanced the evil yeah. i guess you yeah. call it i would say that it wasn't it's not until later in the book where um where they go to that one town that's that's caught that's under attack and the spell kind of breaks and they real the men like kind of look around and realize that what they've been doing and you're just like oh my god wait this is not everybody had decided to go on this journey with them you know like they got caught up right it's juju which is really ugh. i didn't think about that now how much this reminds me of <laughs> stormlight archive <laughs> Stormlight Archive uh, by Brandon Sanderson is a series that we would love to talk about. Um, <laughs> I just don't know if it's possible because the books are so long. And they're supposed to be, I think, 10 eventually. Yeah, I think I thought it may. I think it was seven. Seven. I thought yeah. it was 10. Well, it, well either I'm here for all up to number four. Yeah. And I'm here for all of them. Uh, it, it's so good that's a confession that's the book I was reading when I wasn't reading this <laughs> <laughs> or when I was supposed to be reading this so our other characters we have Onya Sonwa's lover partner and brother in sorcery I guess you can call it yeah, yeah. because they have the same master his name is M- Mwita mm-hmm. um her mother, how do you say her mother's name? Najiba. Najiba. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked her a lot too. I do too. It's you, you, you get her. It's, it's what I like about her is that you get her POV like during, during that horrible scene. You find out that she's been raped. She goes back. Her husband. I told myself I wasn't going to curse in this. So bleep, bleep, Idris <laughs> <laughs> and his no good self. Who find after uh, who hid during the attacks? Could it wasn't brave? Hid during the attacks to save his life. But when his wife comes back and he realizes that she's been raped, like basically cast her out. Um, but anyway, what I like about her is that she's kind of a minor figure in the book, but she's also so influential. Like her mm-hmm. hands are like always kind of in everything. You find out that she is also a magical. Po- she's also magical. She's also got powers. Um, and it kind of speaks to why Onyesomu Onye is so powerful. Her father is an evil sorcerer of like the highest degree, but her mother also has her, had this power. And what we learn is that um, Dai was, he sought her Najiba out specifically. Like this was a targeted attack. And uh, the reason that he did, did so is probably because he knew that she was special and she had his powers, but he wanted to, you know, get her with son and... He didn't. He failed. She had a daughter. And I think that's her magic. Um, You know, her prayers to Ani and her her prayers to the Almighty granting her uh, that peace because I imagine what Onye Son would have been like if she had been a boy. Dai when it came for her. Yeah, he probably would have, you know, came and claimed her like he did. Well, we find out another, like, big twist, I guess, is we find out that Emwita's original 
teacher before Aro was in fact Daib. Um, he doesn't know that Daib, M- Mwita doesn't know that Daib is Onye's father and Onye doesn't know that, you know, who Mwita's teacher was, but it's clear he was looking for someone like her. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, her, I think when we find out that um, that her mother was, how do you say it, I guess? She wasn't really transporting herself, but she was like visiting the she towns. Like astral projecting. Magically. Herself. Yeah, she was like astral projecting herself yeah. to all the towns before Onye Sonu gets there to tell them like the stories of her and made her a legend so that by the time she arrives, people know who she is and they're expecting her and they revere her. Yeah. Except for those fellows who thought that she was a sex worker and tried to rape her and she turned into a beast and was ready to kind of kill everybody until Amuta stopped her. Yeah. I th- he he was pretty crucial too because she would have killed everyone and herself if she didn't have him there to temper her, I feel like. Oh yeah, definitely. He was off in her her voice of reason, her conscious um, her conscience, sorry, and um, and it's and it's what's interesting is that there is so throughout the throughout the book you learn that women are not supposed to be magical. There's no place for women in magic. Um, they it's you know it's for men, and uh, that's why uh, Aro refuses to teach her. That's why Sola is spectac- uh, skeptical of her, and that's why Imwita has. You know, he loves her. Obviously, he loves her. You, and you find out how much he loves her and how much he's committed to her. But, you know, from time to time, the sexism that's in their, that's in their society comes up in the ways that he interacts with her and uh, plays into his resentment of her actually being a sorceress when he failed his initiation to, uh, mm-hmm. to become a sorcerer. He, uh, and, and then the fact the that book, he's like, why, why you? Why not me? And then even the prophecy about this Anuru sorcerer who's supposed to rewrite the great book, even that prophecy, it wasn't even about an Anuru sorcerer. It was about an Ewu woman. Mm-hmm. And the person who got that prophecy, just one, couldn't believe it would be a woman, so he just changed it to a man. And two, couldn't believe it would be an Ewu, so changed it to an Anuru. Yeah. And so, you know... Even in that, the sexism and I don't know, is that racism, colorism? Yeah. Um, couldn't even allow somebody who is powerful enough to be receiving prophecies, couldn't even allow him to accept what he was receiving because mm-hmm. it wasn't what he felt was the right one. Right. Right. And let me see that. So this whole time, mm-hmm. there's been a prophecy about Onye and she has no idea. Because everyone's talking about this new this tall sorcerer. bearded tall new sorcerer, you know, and 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 with that description, then the person that must that they must be thinking about is Dai because he fits that bill, yeah. right? So here's right. the guy, and like they're like, he's coming to write rewrite the great book, and he's doing that through genocide, when it's mm-hmm. absolutely the opposite. And I really like um, this whole concept of. Uh, rewriting the great book so the great book is like the holy text in this world and the holy text is the reason why okks have been enslaved and uh news have been given dominance over there and i should have i meant to look that up a little bit more but basically the okk were the first people they were there first and while the creator had slept and <laughs> rested her eyes, they got up to no good and they invented technology and they tried to like basically become super powerful. And she in, in turn created the Nuru people to basically cast, um, put them in check and uh, enslave yeah, them. And that was, their, them. that was their punishment was that they were to be enslaved. And so, according, to the, according to the writers of the great book. Yes, who were probably men. Who were men. probably in Nuru. Yes. Right. <laughs> so, not that that's problematic at all or anything. <laughs> and and Onye doesn't believe in Ani. Nope. She, you know, that was a question that Aro asked her when he first took her on as a student. 
he asked her about her belief. She said she doesn't believe in Ani. And, but, you know, she'll allow people to believe what they want as long as she can ridicule them in her head. Yeah, <laughs> which I love. Yeah, that which was really I love. funny. She's like, live and let live. Do your thing as long as you, you know, just don't don't bother me. I won't bother you. But I'll make fun of you in, in, my, in my head. And that's how we can both coexist. Um, you know, it's not the best outlook, but it's better than what's going on. It's better what's going on uh, there. So... So, so yeah, so this is prophecy that someone is supposed to come and rewrite the new book, uh, the new book, the, the, the great, great book. book. And <laughs> I'm laughing and I'll tell you about that later. Uh, or somebody's supposed to come <laughs> rewrite the great book. And she has no idea that it's her, but it turns out that it's her. It's her job. She's on a mission to go um, into the west or the east. Give me a cardinal direction. So basically go into become the change in this world to let people know that you know what they're doing has been wrong and yeah it's it's crazy because like in addition to all this and discovering that she's the one that this prophecy is about um the way that she passes initiation is by getting to see her own death right right not just see it but actually experience experience it and she doesn't know that it's her own that it's her own death when she experiences it she just knows she's experiencing a death I have a question for you. Do you think that's why yeah. she passed initiation? Because she didn't re- realize it was her own? Hmm. I think... Maybe. My theory is that that's why she was able to pass in- initiation and Amwita wasn't. Because he knew what to expect. He knew it was his own death that he was experiencing and he wasn't able to face it. And that's why he failed. That makes sense. Because mm-hmm. she, he's had all these... I mean, Emwita has had all these years of training through exactly. first through Daib and then through Aro. Mm-hmm. And with her, it's like she's just coming in raw and like. Yeah. And that's where you, know, you, that's no where idea. you see, uh, you know, the, the sexism has actually become a handicap in this situation. Right. That's why Aro isn't able to really train any other sorcerers because they get all this background information before they go into the initiation. You're going to see something. They're probably told them, Hey, we're going to see something. It's going to be your own death. You know, if you pass it, you know, you, what you, you, you pass, if you're able to, you know, deal with it, then you pass initiation. And if you don't, then you fail. But like going into it, knowing that you're going to experience your own death and to be able to come to, you know, grips with that it would explain to me why Aru hasn't had any other successful apprentices yeah I mean I don't know if Aro necessarily tells them flat out that they're going to experience their death because I remember her asking Muita and he wouldn't tell her anything and I don't know if it's because she's not supposed to know or if he didn't want to help mm-hmm or if he didn't want to scare her, maybe. Maybe. Maybe he didn't think she could handle it because she's a woman. Carrie said she didn't even expect her life to be in danger when she, when she went and saw Sola. Right. Sola throws those bones and she's just kind of like, oh, cool. Like some, what who, was that bird or something? creepy guy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, wow, are you human? Like, you look really weird. And she just kind of moves on. Meanwhile, she's like <laughs> facing, face, not un- unwittingly facing her death. and. Mm-hmm. You know, facing what? this man who could totally end her. Yeah. I mean, even when she attacked Aro in the spirit realm, she didn't know what she was doing. No. She just knew that she could hurt him, but she didn't know what she was actually doing. She didn't know she almost killed him. Right. She didn't know. Well, and that's because she was, you know, she wasn't given the information that she that she needed. And I just want to point out real quick that, you know, uh, that Eve, we know that she gets stoned and that's how she dies which is a mm-hmm. horrible, horrible, buried up to her neck in stone. Buried up to her neck in stone. In stone. Death. And gracious. we get foreshadowing from that in the very beginning, because as soon as she enters society with her mom after living in the death, like when she gets sick as a baby, uh, and her mom enters that town to look for medicine mm-hmm. for her, um, the townspeople, once they see that she's Ewu, start throwing rocks at her or her mom, and one hits her in the head. And, so, and then that's also how we lose poor Binta. Binta... Binta's death actually like broke my heart. It was so sad. It was so sad. I didn't. I didn't see it coming. You know, it's like, oh, here she is. She's empowered now. She's having a good time. Um, Binta is one of Onye's friends who was molested by her father since she was since she was a, a young girl. 
Um, she's yes. known in their town as the girl who was so pretty that even her father couldn't resist her. Isn't that awful? There were men lining up because they wanted to marry her because they just figured she's so lovely that her father can't resist. Like, ugh. Such a, you know, dark way. And when, to go back, when they do their 11th year right and they do the um, female genital mutilation, they use that scalpel that has juju on it so that anytime the girls feel aroused, they'll feel intense pain that'll get just worse and worse and worse until they stop. Mm -hmm. And it protects her for a while. And I think they whipped her father. Yeah, they, they couldn't do anything about her father raping her until she turns 11, which I don't know why. I think it's because she's at the age of womanhood. That's they, Onye says that there's that period from like 11 right. to 16 where they're both a girl, both and also a woman. They're a child and a woman, and they get they have a voice as an adult in their culture. Right. I got I got that explanation. I just didn't get why they would bother making it a thing. Why not punish him for hurting a child like that? You know, mm -hmm. why is that something that they have to just let her deal with it? Until Allow to continue for 11 years of her life or who knows how really, yeah. Right. It's a very horrible. I was really glad that she murdered him. Me too. She's like, this chick was skipping <laughs> on the way out of town. She's so happy. I poisoned my dad. <laughs> because, you know, it only kept him off of her for so long. Mm -hmm. And eventually he went right back to it. And to know that she was enduring that emotional pain and all, but also oh, the physical, physical pain. pain. The physical pain. And you, 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 and they, they hint at the fact that it's painful, but it's not until Onyan and Wita are, you know, get intimate for the first time that, she, and she describes it's like this pain that starts down there and then it like radiates until it's like in her whole body and she can't even concentrate anymore you know she mm -hmm. had to and he's and we just like oh i'm sorry come on you knew that was gonna happen were you really sorry <laughs> like really i do wonder how much he knew like did did Amwita know that like how much of what aro does does Amwita know mm -hmm. because the other thing that we have to re rec uh, that we have to remember is that even though Amwita has all this training and was trained to be a sorcerer he's also Ewu, right this is why him and onye bond in the first place because he's the first time that she's ever seen someone who looks like her um mm -hmm. and so even if aro recognizes that Amwita is gifted and that he's got a talent for sorcery and he's also got this medical training and that kind of stuff he is still a child of rape he is still you know what they see as an individual who is prone to violence by nature uh by virtue of or <laughs> curse rather of his conception even though he isn't born in it right, right i was gonna say even though he, he is not is actually just mixed yeah he had two but parents. that doesn't really he happen a, a new a, a parent Nuru and okk parents who loved each other but mm -hmm. that doesn't change the fact that his skin looks like he is a product of um, Nuru violence. And, and because of that, he, his station in life is not what it would have been had he come out darker or lighter skinned. Mm. Ugh. I was going to say something about the scalpel. Oh, yeah, I was saying. Um, I don't remember. Was it? Uh, the Ada who told her that the scalpel was mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I yeah. couldn't remember. She goes knocking on her door and ask and and asking her about what the five mystic uh, mystic sorry points are, and mm. she tells her she, that even even though her and Aro are married, that he's they still have secrets. He keeps secrets from her, and that no matter how she tries, he always performs the juju on the scalpel of the for the eleventh rite when she's not around. And they see that as a way to protect the girls. Mm -hmm. It says that they for it forces them to put their foot down when it comes to their virtue, right? Because if it's cause if something is causing you this much pain, then you're not going to let it continue. And the Ada thinks this is a great thing because when she was young, she got knocked up by a man who said that he loved her and left her pregnant with twins. Mm -hmm. She said she was what, like fifteen, mm -hmm. and unmarried, pregnant, and he left her when she became pregnant. And so they see it as a way to protect the girls. Whereas Lu Yu, my fave. No Tansy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no Tansy. 
Lou, um, your fave. Yep. Lou, you my fave. Lou, you love sex and is like, I enjoy it, so why shouldn't I be able to do it? And that drives her insane. And I, I think one of the things I loved about her, too, is like she's so... She's like this pampered, beautiful, you know, princess Mm -hmm. who gives no fucks and just does whatever she wants. Yep. And sometimes it's kind of messed up, like sleeping with DT's Fanasi, but sleeping with Fanasi, you know, your best, uh, your bestie's fiance. Yeah, fine. Don't hook up with your bestie's fiance. That's true. (laughs) And, uh, but, you know, she wasn't one of the ones who ran off to town. And she fiercely defended Onye Sonwu yeah. and fought for her and died for her. I like her character because unlike um, DT and even unlike Binta, like she was the one who was most able to change and to actually um, to, to be open to understanding what it meant for them to exist as Ewu. You know, it's like she, yeah. they live. They were they were lucky in their upbringing in that Jahir was a place that's all okay. Case so they weren't you know they weren't enslaved there. They weren't enslaved there like they were in in you know the Seven River Cities. And it's not until they go to the town where Daib is that she, for the first time, understands what it's like to live in a society where OKK are actually um, subservient to Nuru and, and asked to do whatever they want, like just walking down the street, like, hey, can you go, can you carry this with me? Can you go watch this child? Can you just like, and they ha- just have to say yes. Mm-hmm. They just have to say yes. And like, I feel like, remember, uh, DT and Fanasi had moments where they could be really nasty to Onye because she's Ewu. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she would say like, as soon as you get mad at me, there you go. You yeah. Bring that up. Exactly. You know, they they were like, oh, we're not used to sleeping outside like you filthy Ewu, you know, and it's like, we've been friends now for how long? And as soon as you get mad at me, we basically slip into racial slurs. Yeah. You know, and Binti always just kind of stayed quiet, didn't want to ruffle feathers. But I correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember Luyu turning on her like that when she'd be upset. Um, no, Lulu, Lulu only turned on her when it was, when it's like, basically, we can hear you and, uh, and when we just grow my sex. clip back too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> While you're on this mission to rewrite the great, the great book and you're glow, growing your own clip back, grow mine back too, because it's not fair that you're the only person who, ne- who can experience pleasure from sex. Right. And if you experience too much, you get background sounds. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's um, that's the only time I feel like she's ever really turned to her. Although maybe early on when they were at school, she like would kind of like scoff at her and roll her eyes. But once they were on the road, I mean, she even offered her. She's like, "Listen, there's a this is a lot for you to bear. Like, please share the burden with me." And and um, Luyu is actually the first person that Onye tells. That, that that she's experienced her own death and that's what she's seen and so she knows what the end is and what she's walking you know um what she's going to you know she's are literally on the path to die from the second that she leaves her town <laughs> um yeah let's you know what? Let's talk about Fanasi. That's DT's husband, since we brought him up. Um, who went on this trip? You know, he just wanted to stay home and bake bread, but he was in love with his wife, um, and decided to go and, and follow her. And I don't know. I mean, I guess that in the beginning, like I feel like he knew that what he was getting into because he was outraged by the injustices that he saw in the vision, and. He wanted to make change, but like as the journey went on, it just became too hard for him. Yeah, I mean, it, was, it seemed like the further they got away from home, the more, because I, in a way, there was the immediate reaction. <laughs> Sorry, Carrie, I remember when she beat DT. <laughs> she oh yeah. Her ass. <laughs> yeah <she did. laughs> um, there was the immediate reaction when she showed him what happened to her mother and the other, what Onye showed Fanasi what happened to her mother and the other Okeke women. So there was that that immediate reaction of just like, 
disgust, rage, sadness, you know, all of that, that, that spurred him to finally decide to go along with it. Right. But I think at the same time, it was almost, because remember, they're young. It was almost like a fun adventure mm-hmm. until shit started to really get real. And the further they got away from home as they ran out of supplies and as they started realizing how dangerous it was. Mm-hmm. Um, they, you know, they, Fanasi and DT, obviously, really started rethinking whether or not they wanted to continue. And then, you know, they didn't continue. And we, didn't we continue. will never know what happened to they them. Dipped out in the middle of the sandstorm. When right. The sand, when the sandstorm uh, left, uh, sorry, when, when Seiku brought down the sandstorm, they left. They left them, stole their camel and everything. Poor Sandy. I, what, do you think they made it home? I don't know. Um, I don't, actually. I don't think so because even though even though um, they had like the camel and I'm sure they had some resources, it was really Emwita and Onye's resourcefulness that was keeping them alive. Oh my god, I just realized. I was like, who was making rock fires for them? Right. Oh, they didn't make it home. So like heading <laughs> back home, they're... You know, it was Amwinta was the one who was using magic to hunt. Mm-hmm. Was using magic to make rock fires so that they didn't create smoke and attract anybody. Right. Protected them from wild animals. You know, it was, yeah. it was really the two of them that kept that group alive. And I feel like the two of them on their own heading back now, they probably, if they made it, it's because they stopped in another town. Yeah. And decided to just to wait there. it out there. It, I, yeah. In my mind, I see that if they made it, they they went to a town and then they just settled there. You know, like maybe he set up his bread shop as a new baker in town or something. Um, but I can see them. I can see them not making it because I don't. I don't know. Were they suddenly bonded again? And like you know, they're just like you know, we're in this together. We both realize this is not what we wanted. We could be happy and comfortable. You know. Um, living in a town somewhere or living in our town uh and why should they go without that they, i mean at the end of at the very end when it boils down to it they weren't about that life at all no they weren't and and I, and i don't i don't necessarily fault them no um, they were young it's a hard trip it's a it's a hard it's trip. a hard trip and you're asking most likely people end in death. exactly you know like bent like bent is already dead She's already dead. They watched their friend get uh, their back of her head smashed up with the brick, and then the crowd tore her apart. Right. Oh, man. So I don't necessarily. I was angry at them for leaving. Like lawless. But at the same worth. time, I don't necessarily fault them because not everybody's cut out for that kind of sacrifice. Because mm-hmm. I mean, at the end, everyone is dead. At the Binta, end, everyone is dead. Luyu, Muita. And Onye, mm-hmm. everyone is dead. Spoiler alert! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's so, hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, because, you know, it's like she's dead, but she also rewrites the book, so she's back. She turns into a dragon. I forgot what the name for it was. Me too. I can't remember what, the, but whatever her, it is that her mom is. I'm going to look it up. Hold on a second. I was trying to Google it. Do you want to talk it. about... Um, Na, 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 na. Binta's death. I'm gonna look up the name oh, for that Binta's dragon creature. Death. Um, it's so well. Okay, so after they're on the road for a bit, they realize that they need supplies. Uh, Onye is aware that there is a town ahead because she's been transforming into a vulture and flying on to scout because they need to know when towns are there. Um, because it's dangerous for them. They need because her and Wita and Wita need to cover up because they are Awu, um, and Awu in different. It depending on where you are. Sometimes they're accepted into the society, but the women are prostitutes. Um, and what happens is they happen into. They enter one such town. Well, not on their choice. DT and Binta sneak out in the middle of the night. And they go into the town, and once Onye discovers that they're gone, um, the rest of the crew heads down into the town, into the little village, rather. And they find them at a bar. Like, there's Benta, titties out, <laughs> enjoying her palm wine and, like, getting fondled by, by uh, you know, yeah, strange men. Living their best life. Living their best life, you know. Um, 
by a man who's not her father. You know, this is her first like sexual experience with someone who is not her dad. Um, and so the liberation and stuff that she must feel, but, and then they're drunk and they say, you know, there's an exchange and they say some really mean things to Onye that, um, you know, in retrospect are, I mean, no, they're just horrible. And so Onye leaves. She decides that she doesn't want to be in this place. But when she gets outside, that's when she's attacked by a group of men who mistake her for a prostitute because that's what Awu women are in their town. You can take over. I'm mad. Well, we already told the story. She turns into a beast and is getting ready to tear them apart. Yeah. And and then and also once they find out that she's the only the soul, only. all everyone changes. Even the people because while she was being attacked, there were people who were watching her and were just kinda of shrugging it off and kept it moving mm-hmm. because they just felt like, Well, she's able, so who cares? She must have asked for it. Yeah. But um, I found the word and yes. I don't know how to say it. Kiponyungo. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. A fire spitter, which to me sounded like a dragon. I like the um, idea of a sand dragon. Yeah. So anyway, that that was what I was looking for. Um, Yeah. There were a bunch of, like, reveals. You know, like, Mm -hmm. when we first start reading it, she's basically telling us from the very beginning that she is going to die she's telling the story from her cell right she's in she's in a jail cell in the last town that they make it to and she's she's telling some random person who we never find out who this is uh her story she's like you know what you have this computer machine all right take down my story because someone needs to know right and we don't realize that from the very beginning like this is her rewriting the great book (laughs) right right and then even when she experiences her death she talks about seeing this woman's arms, looking down at her hands and her arms, and they're darker than her, and have tattoos. And so, it's like you don't. It's like you know, but at the same time, I didn't immediately put it together no. that the death she was experiencing was hers mm-hmm. because she just told me it's a woman who's darker than her. But it's she's darker because she's been traveling through the desert. And when did you and realize then, it? Um, when she got when she was getting the tattoos, the tattoos by Ting. Yeah, that's when she's like she looked down at her hand and it was a stub. And, and I went when I got to that part, I was like, wait a minute. And I went back to like look back at that part, and I was like, hold on a second. But then I still I don't know if it really even clicked because I read it the second time I read it. I was like, I'm so stupid. How did I not put this together? <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, that was really cool magic. The tattoo magic. In Sibiti, I think, is what it was called. It was basically, so Ting, who was one of the Va people, that was her specialty, is this uh, magical writing. And when Onye goes and faces off her father because she's died, she's died and has been reborn um, by Ani, basically remade into the person that she's supposed to be. Um, she figures that she's strong enough to, like, you know, enter the wilderness, which is a spirit world, and fight her father. And she goes searching for him, like rips off across the desert and um, encounters him, not realizing that he's been waiting for this moment to tear her mm-hmm. to pieces. She, she regularly underestimates how powerful he is. Yeah, I don't. And uh, overestimates how powerful she is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And because he's so, you know, he's such a wise yet evil sorcerer. He knows exactly how powerful he is because you know what? He's been through this process as a sorcerer. He knows what level her magic is at. Um, even though I think he, he does underestimate her, but he knows better, like, Mm -hmm. you know, um, that she can't take him on. There's no way. There's no way. And so he poisons her in the wilderness Mm -hmm. or spirit realm, whatever that might be. And Ting has to do the word, the basically tattoo magic to stop (laughs) it from spreading. (laughs) <laughs> we're, so sorry. Like <laughs> we're sorry we're sorry it's I, whatever it's called yeah we yeah it's tattoo magic i like it i'm trying to think i don't know if i've seen that anywhere else i've never read it anywhere else hmm. yeah the only thing that anyway. comes to mind is like maui from moana right but that was different yeah 
And that's like I have a list of my accompl accomplishments, but not like magical. Yeah, magical writing. Yeah. It's interesting though. Mm -hmm. um, finding out that after so another like reveal, finding out that Aro had been protecting her all those years mm -hmm. after she did her eleventh right. Yep. Because the eleventh right is what made her father able to see her with that red eye, and he was sending <laughs> things to kill her. <laughs> yeah, that's how I thought of it too. Is that I was so wrong. <laughs> and he's sending all these things to kill her scorpions and snakes. And mm -hmm. Aro has been protecting her this whole time. And we don't know that. We don't know that it's Aro yeah, until later. Until later. Um, and it was on a reread that I came, I remembered when um, there was a snake in the yard and a vulture came and killed it before it could get to her. Mm -hmm. And then. The first time I read that, I didn't think that that was Aro. The second time I was reading it, after knowing that Aro had been protecting her, is when I realized that that vulture was, in fact, Aro. Mm -hmm. And so when she picked up the feather and became a vulture, she wasn't just becoming a random vulture. She was becoming Aro as a vulture, mm -hmm. which is probably why she had all those feelings as a vulture, too. Yeah, she was an angry vulture. Yep, she had, well, yeah, she lots very, very angry. Lots of anger with her. And it's I, I enjoy the irony, too, that, like, although, like, Aro is the one who's protecting her, it's his magic who activated it in the first place. You know, like, she was basically, um, whether we, like, I guess the theory is that her father would have come looking for her because he knew that he had a, he was hoping for a son to, like, follow in his footsteps, help him, like, carry out his mission of, you know, of this genocide against the OKK. Uh, but it's not until um, her her clit is removed that he's that he he becomes aware of her and knows like where she is and is able to look look upon her, um, and that she becomes aware of him. And she doesn't realize that it's actually him. She just is aware of this like big red eye, this big angry red eye that's always looking at her, and she just knows that it's evil. Um, but you know, it's like, okay, Aro, well, this is your fault, <laughs> you know? If you hadn't put the juju on the scalpel, like, would this still have happened? Um, mm -hmm. And I think how, there's also... How would he have found her if she had been a boy? I don't know. Maybe there's a different, but, you know, uh, the boys don't go through their whatever rights until they're, what, it was like 15 or 16? Yeah, but they don't, they don't do... They, but, circumcision. Though. But I think that maybe the father was like, whatever rite of passage that they have on the male side, which we never learn about, like what their rituals are, maybe that's what have, uh, what's would have enabled him to find his son that he was looking for. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't seem to me that he's able to keep tabs on her mom. No. After, you know, after that rape. Which is and interesting. And he wouldn't have even known if she survived. Yeah. Because she just went into the desert for five years, six years. Which is interesting. So, I mean, maybe he was just, like, raping all the magic women that he could find. Yeah, that's possible. So she she very likely could have magical siblings out there that she doesn't even know about. OMG. What if there's a sequel and it's and it's Daif's, like, <laughs> son who, like, grew up and just, like, learning to spy on her? Whew, that would be crazy. I'm really interested in... Um, what we're gonna get to see in the show mm -hmm, me too when it eventually comes out i think it's just still in development right now so who knows when that'll happen but i'm looking I'm forward to seeing all the transformations of her transforming to vulture to sparrow and, and like that all that the her magical learning that process um the tattoo magic i'm looking forward to seeing that that's Definitely. gonna be super 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 cool and then the obviously, wilderness the what does the wilderness look like because every time is i it imagine look it, like black panther yes that's what i was gonna say <laughs> every time i imagine it i imagine it in black panther and me too <laughs> that's exactly what else how could i picture it, it um it's just like such a beautiful place where they're shooting stars all the time <laughs> <laughs> It just looks like northern lights in the background. Yeah. It's like the <laughs> essence of things, like some combination between that and like Shades Mar. I was just going to say that the wilderness also reminds me of Shades Mar because she talks about um, 
you're not seeing like actual people you're seeing like the color like their essence mm-hmm. and then it made me think of shades more with these beads that all represent something yeah you have to touch it to see what it is to see what it wants to be what, yeah. it, what it remembers that it was ah oh, it's so awesome oh, we should totally <laughs> we should totally do stormlight it's so good that's that's <laughs> one that i'm waiting for an adaptation to though i would love to see that on the screen um yeah uh, there's, I, it's, I'm looking forward to seeing this for sure. This, I think what I really enjoyed about this book is that it was so different from anything else that I had read. Um, not only because it's like, like Afro, like African futurism, right? And it's like drawing on, on, um, like folklore and mythology from Africa, which is awesome. But it's just the way that she is just writing it you know you've got this character and you never i don't i feel like this book never goes where you're expecting it to it's not like a traditional hero's journey or a traditional hero's quest as we've you know grown used to them and been indoctrinated (laughs) to but it's very it's very different um and it gets really real in ways that are just you know you have a very visceral response to whether it's you know, witnessing, witnessing the rape or like being in the room as these girls are, you know, going, undergoing female genital mutilation. Um, and what is that like? I remember when I read that part, I was like, (gasps) I had to stop and breathe. And I I definitely was like flinching and crossing my legs. Oh my God. Just like, how, how are they going through the without and without screaming and the, and the great pride that these girls have in the fact that they were able to go through this without screaming and how like remember they said like the the girls who'd gone who'd gone through it the year before had all screamed um Mm. and it's just bonkers to me to even consider it like i'm screaming on the inside thinking about it right now yeah i i banged my knee on the corner (laughs) of my bed frame and i thought i tore my acl and i was just like laying on the floor screaming so i can't Can't i can't imagine somebody just taking a scalpel and just slicing my ten thousand nerve endings (laughs) or or whatever the number is like no way absolutely no no way um you know one thing we didn't talk about the okk technology yes uh so, so that's something that was really interesting is the way so there there's this weird it's like how technology is used and framed in here. Like there's obvious things like the capture stations, which are used to pull water out of thin air. And, um, and that's how they're allowed to like, how they can drink water in the desert and not die of thirst, which is fantastic. But then when they get to that cave where there's all this discarded technology, um, because technology is seen as um, the catalyst for their enslavement, uh, it's really interesting to watch them interact with uh, the supernatural, like the spiders in the cave and the 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 the, the, with the sorcerers who've been hanging there since Amuita fled, um, and they were much fresher then. And just like the, all those magical elements, like juxtaposed with juxtaposed with this technology, which is also magical in some way, right? Like you can view technologies, and when it works really well, it is magical, like what we're doing now, like it's magic. Um, but to know that, like, what advances could they have made or what could have, um, you know, could this genocide have been, been stopped if they'd referred to some of this technology that they had um, lost and, and discarded and, you know, were afraid, afraid of. And I guess it's, it, it's, it's one of those things that, one of those themes that happens, uh, that keeps recurring throughout the book is that oh well it's just been this way for a long time and nobody remembers why anymore you know like same thing with like with their with with the 11th right oh it's like that we just don't know why that happens anymore um there are many times that that comes up and people don't question you mentioned the 11th right to go back to that um on your son whose mother didn't want her to do it exactly she was not circumcised Mm -hmm. she thought it was barbaric and archaic and was just like why do they do this here Mm -hmm. and even her her father her stepfather he yep. he agreed that it was but because they do it in joy here and usually she decided to do here, it. so yeah um there is a book called the wait a minute let me think the book of the phoenix 
Mm-hmm. Hold on. I, I saw it earlier when I was reading it. I think it's the Book of Phoenix or something. The Book of Phoenix, mm-hmm. which is that. So that came out five years after Who Fears Death, and it's like a prequel that kind of tells you what happened, like what ended the world, basically. Right. To right. Create the world that we're in now. I haven't read it yet, but I do plan to. It's, it's, I think I bought it. I think it's, I it's you see, like, so you voluntarily, like, you see Onye voluntarily going into situations of death, right? Like, she, you know that this quest is going to take her to her death. You know that she's going to die. She knows that going into her 11th, right, she doesn't know what is going to change, right? But it's the death, it's the death of her sexual pleasure, right? That's yeah. her, the death of her, uh, I guess, ultimate expression, ability to express her, express herself as, you know, a woman. And she does it voluntarily. But she also says that nobody told us what that little piece of flesh was for. Right? Right. Right. And it's just because... So, yeah, she goes into all these wild situations and is very often ignorant as to what she's facing and what she's dealing with. Like, really often. Very much so. But she's so stubborn and so just, like... Fuck it, we'll do it live. And yeah, goes for it, you know, but it, it's just the reminder of how young she is. Yeah, it, well, is it? You know everything. Is it how young she is, or how much like her father she is? That too. You I, know, you know, they because say she has his eyes and his singing voice, but she probably she does seem to have his temperament as well because Najib is not like that at all. No, you don't see any of those traits from her. You see it from him. Um, you know, his willingness to just to to go in to create situations that are you know where there's lots of adversity and punishment because i'm just th- i keep thinking about when she gets into his office and she finds all the little recordings of every rape he's ever committed um and you know I'm sick my note here is his power and his perversions and that's one of them you know, and it also makes me think I'm like, whoa, if this is this is why he's able to win. like he's a voyeur, right? At the, of like the worst kind. He wants to relive this thing. He he wants to see what's happening. That's why he's like, you know, he's able to check on her constantly and see what's happening. Um, yeah, it's uh, which is ironic given his mom, but you know, whatever. Dave was terrifying. I, every time she encountered him, I was scared. Mm-hmm. She just knew and that she wasn't ready. Yeah, she wasn't ready. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I was going to say one of the things about the way it's, the book is written. Because we're getting it from the viewpoint of Onye and her friends and like they're from when they're kids just into like their late teens everything is so straightforward yeah like everything they say is just so straightforward <laughs> like does this count as a YA novel since it's like young people i've never really i don't know i think i was looking up and it was like they're when they categorize her books they're like binti is ya uh this one is an adult novel yeah i mean <laughs> considering the themes yeah you know oh, so just so much it's so yeah there's no sugarcoating anything that happens in this book it's just straight up like this is the reality of the situation can you handle it can you not handle it what do you think about the fact that like Dai, like even though she destroys that town kills all the men impregnates all the women but there's this vulture right the cri- with the crippled with the crippled uh wing. right so i went back and i was reading that again because what I realized is she didn't kill Daib. Mm-hmm. She crippled him, but she also crippled him magically. Yes. And for him, that's probably worse than death. Yeah. Because... He... Ooh, it's giving me Avatar Last Airbender vibes. <laughs> yeah. Well, because he's lost his magic, so he's lost his power. Mm-hmm. Because if he doesn't have the power to make the other Nuru's extra violent and then he doesn't have the power to 
do things to people to scare them and control them, mm-hmm. what who's going to follow him? Right, exactly. If he can't brainwash people into doing his bidding, then what good is, you know, what can he do? Like, he can't brainwash you and he can't bully you. So what's left? Mm-hmm. Do, does anybody respect him? They respect him as a powerful sorcerer. But he's not anymore. Mm-hmm. He's, she's, she's ruined him magically. So what is he now? So she, she didn't kill him. But in a way, she kind of did because there's nothing left of him. Yeah. And the Nurus have no reason to keep him around. No. Nope. What's he good for? No, I mean, and yeah, uh, nothing, you know, um, especially what the only person who could stop him did. Right. And so now they've got to come to terms with this new world order, as it were. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And I just look, I'm thinking about like if he like say survived, he transformed back into a person like what's this town full of women full of women who are pregnant going to do he's the only man well because within that radius right so the men come back and like okay well he were there's supposed to be this all-powerful um sorcerer but you couldn't protect us right you couldn't protect us from this awu witch yeah so the final chapter the teaser chapter where basically she has now rewritten the great book and it brings us back to her cell again except this time she turns into to the Kaponyongo mm-hmm. the fire breather <laughs> and flies away so is that the beginning of the rewriting of the great book is Onye now alive and we've now entered an alternate timeline mm-hmm. I don't know I wondered about that I wondered about that. It's like, well, she's lives in a, she's alive in a place where Amita is alive still, and her ch- their child is alive still. And what does that mean? Um, I felt I you know what I did appreciate that that alternate ending, right? Because yeah. it just like it was just like, oh my god, like. And I wonder why. Is this she what I mean? Like, is it an alternate ending? Uh, is it an alternate ending, or is it? the actual ending because right. she has rewritten the great book through mm-hmm. her actions mm-hmm. and what does that mean does that change everything along the past timeline um, I want to think about that more yeah. is there was it this like a butterfly effect or yeah butterfly effect <laughs> or, or mandala effect is, right the great book is now rewritten so does that mean history is rewritten and now they're in a completely different world. Mm-hmm. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, Who dun, knows? Dun. We did it! Next book! <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. The next book is one we're super excited about. We cannot wait to talk about this book. Yeah, so so this was Who Fears Death by Nnedi Okorafor. Please go read it. Please it's read so it. It's so good. It's so happy. If you haven't read it already, we really enjoyed it. Um... You know, we would have talked about it a lot sooner if we weren't cursed, but, you know, it seems the curse has at least lightened up. Yeah. Apologies for the screaming in the background. You know, it's funny. It's like, so does that mean if we try to do this next book that there's going to be zombies? <laughs> Is there going to be a zombie ac- apocalypse? Oh God, I hope not. I mean, either. Our next book, um, we're going to go live again on May 23rd. And the book we'll be talking about is Dread Nation by Justina Ireland. Um, We should probably put that in the Mm -hmm. description. I'll put that in the podcast notes as well. Um, So yeah, Dread Nation by Justina Ireland. It's a book where it's like an alternate history where the Civil War ends because the dead start to rise. Dun, dun, dun. Mm-hmm. And so now we're in a world, a post-Civil War world, where there are zombies. But this book isn't about running from zombies. It's about nope. living in a world where there's zombies in the background. And it's re- like it's, I don't usually get into a lot of horror or things like that. Sometimes I do. But this is so different from any other type of zombie book I've it's ever, or zombie yeah. fiction period that I've ever encountered. Um, so it's refreshing. Really good. It's super refreshing. Um, it's not it's, The Walking uh, Dead, you know. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's not The Walking Dead. It's um, it's how do you how do you live in this world, this post Civil World War, where racism is very much still a thing, 
and uh, you know one of the tenets of the society, but also have to live in a world where you know everywhere you turn, danger from shamblers is a real thing, which is what they call the zombies. Yes, shamblers. So it follows um, what's her name? I can't remember her name. <laughs> Hold on, let me Google. Because uh, I'm in Who Fares Death Mode. Yeah. I'm looking forward to reading this one again. Uh, na, 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 na. But essentially, so after the Civil War and the, the dead rise up, young black girls are made attendants. And the attendants are basically bodyguards that fight zombies. Jane McKean. Huh? Jane, Jane McKean. yes, Jane. How yes. did I forget name as easy as Jane? I know. So yeah, we're following Jane. It has a sequel called Deathless Divide, but I think we're just we're probably just gonna do the nation and let you get into Deathless Divide. Or maybe yeah. I don't know. Um, there's also a short story mm-hmm. that you can't get in print. It was only I'm looking it up, it was only on this podcast called Nightlight, I believe. Hold on, I'll tell you right now. It's so good. And it's scary. I recommend listening. Read Dread Nation and then turn the lights off. And listen to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it's called Nightlight. Um, and it's a short story that takes place between Dread Nation. It takes place after... Well, no, that's a spoiler. It takes place between Dread Nation and Deathless Divide. So read it's Dread like Nation interlude. first. Yeah, it's like an interlude. Um, I'm looking for it so I can tell you the title. It's called Letters from Home. Yes. It's episode 101 on this podcast called Nightlight. And it's a horror fiction podcast. Oh, man. Dread Um, Dread Nation is so awesome. It's got horror. It's got intrigue. It's got, you know, um, amazing reveals at the end. I did not see that one coming. Um, (laughs) And then it makes it puts which shifts your entire perspective. Right. And then revisit. You get to encounter again in um, in Deathless Divide, uh, but yeah, there's the. Uh, it's so good. I'm so excited. We love. So we love this. May yes. 23rd. Mm-hmm. And then also we'll be doing trivia April 18th. Game and of our Thrones theme, trivia. Dun, 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 yes, because you know we have to do trivia. Our theme will be births, deaths, and resurrections. Yes. So find us on social media. Thousand Eyes One on Twitter, A Thousand Eyes and One on Facebook and Instagram, Thousand Eyes and One on TikTok. Oh, yeah, and we're on TikTok now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're old, so oh, we don't really shoot. know what we're going to do with that. it yet, but we're there. Um, and for just if you want to go back to old podcast episodes and everything like that, it's Thousand Eyes Podcast.com. And that's where I post all our links. So you can go, go back, back as far as you want and listen, listen to our podcast, podcast about Game, Game of Thrones, Thrones yes, and Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, I'll post this as an episode as well, as well for all the listeners out there. For all the listeners out there in Radio so, Land. Thanks, thanks for, for joining us. us. Thanks. We'll see you next time with uh, Justina Ireland's time. Dread Nation. <laughs> <laughs>